Hi everyone, welcome to uh, our second lecture in, um, in uh, chapter 9, our chapter on externalities. I just want to show you what I found in my cupboard as I was getting dressed this morning. I found an original t-shirt, an original souvenir t-shirt from Plakonomics. Can you see that there? Original t-shirt, Plakonomics. Here it is there from, there it is, Micro One. I think this t-shirt is probably at least 12 years old, I would guess. Um, and it's one of the original t-shirts from when Alberto and Isabella started developing the simulation game. And it was pretty primitive back then. And, um, and thanks to their efforts and uh, a lot of IT help along the way, you've got the course that you have today. So um, uh, let's, let's sort of revise where we were the other day. Uh, I've got some slides to do this, but before I get into the slides, just remember that we, we were looking at the areas of externalities the other day, and we saw that externalities can come in the form of positive externalities or negative externalities, and those externalities can come about because of uh, what happens in the production phase of, uh, of, of making a good or the consumption phase of uh, buying and using the good. And an externality is something that falls on a third party, someone who is not part of the transaction. Uh, they're not a buyer or a seller of the product there. Uh, a third party, they may be individuals or they may, it might be society in general. And so we, we looked at these externalities and we, we saw the, the, the um, impact that uh, Maya's perfume had on Benji and then Benji's uh, hot dog ma making had on Maya. And we saw that uh, they could... Um, they can negotiate around their externalities uh, in line with uh, what we call the Coase theorem uh, to arrive at an efficient, uh, an efficient outcome. And I'm going to do a bit more of that today. With the, I'm going to get a bit more specific with the numbers and how we would uh, would look at that if we got some a multiple choice question. And uh, the other thing that we looked at the other day was where negotiation is not possible where there are too many people involved, uh, perhaps where the, the whole of the uh, society is involved, governments then have to get involved. They have to, be, they ha they have to use uh, policy to uh, try and uh, uh, ac accommodate the effects of, of externalities on the market. So we're going to be looking at examples of both those things today with, with new diagrams. And, uh, and a new numerical example. I'm not sure whether we'll have time to start on chapter 10 today. Maybe we will. We'll, we'll just see how we go for time. Otherwise, chapter 10 will be covered in the second lecture of the week. So let's begin with our slides. Um, I'm going to just uh, transition over to our slides now. So... Here we go. All right, and so I'm just going to go, I'm going to slide down through our uh, presentation and we saw all these slides the other day and I want to come down to here. So this, today we're doing Today we're doing lecture, we're doing lecture two of, of uh, chapter nine, part three. Part, what's part three mean? It means chapter nine. It's the third, the third episode where we see that the assumptions of perfect competition do not always hold. And just a very quick then revision of what we did the other day. So... Um, we saw that when we look at perfect competition, of course, when we look at perfect competition, we have all these characteristics and 
bit by bit over the last few weeks, we've seen that these characteristics do not always hold. And because they do not always hold, most of the time, almost all of the time, our markets are not really in perfect competition. So we're, we're looking at the issue of externalities and we defined externalities this way the other day, just a little bit more quick revision. An externality is a cost or a benefit to someone who is not a consumer or producer. So, so someone who we could say is a third party, someone outside the transaction. Consumers being one party, producers or sellers being another party and then someone else who is not involved in the transaction. So we saw this unfold the other day and you'll remember that there was the um, uh, interaction between Maya and Benji and we saw that um, where um, there are positive externalities, the private, the private optimal consumption will be will be less than, right, will be less than uh, the social optimum, right? So the private, private marginal benefit will be less than the social marginal benefit. And we saw some examples of these. Oh, then we looked at how these issues can be solved. What's, what's, the, what's the way of working around these externalities? And we saw that where individuals can negotiate with one another, where individuals can negotiate, the Coase theorem comes into play. The Coase theorem comes into play, and basically people trade in their externality. So the other day, I think uh, Benji was going to persuade Maya to wear more perfume by uh, paying her a couple of dollars for every unit of perfume she she wore, and and then Benji was also going to pay Maya for the privilege of producing uh, an a, a a negative externality when he cooked his hot dogs because the smell was irritating to Maya. He was going to pay her a uh, dollar for every hot dog he cooked to compensate her for the fact that this cooking process was so um, smelly. And um, so, so this is the idea of the Coase theorem. So this is all about these key words here, all about these key words, where they can negotiate, right? Where they can negotiate. Now, you can only negotiate if you have just a few people involved in the transaction of negotiation. Where, where, where large numbers of people are concerned, it is not possible to negotiate. So Maya uh, and, and um, Benji might be able to negotiate around the issue of smell. Maya is going to essentially, um, uh, or Benji is going to buy, buy Maya off in order to, to get her to um, wear more perfume. And Benji is also going to buy Maya off in, in, a, in so that she allows him to, to cook his uh, hot dogs. But that, that, that's the issue of smell in their case. But what about a very big issue of smell? For example, the smell of cigarette smoke. Now, in our society, when people smoke, uh, many other people are going to be affected by that smell. And there's going to be too many people to negotiate with. The Coase theorem will not work under those circumstances because uh, the, the, um, the, the mechanics around negotiation and the costs of negotiation uh, will become too high. So from where, where uh, large numbers of people are involved, we rely on government policy. All right, so the Coase theorem is an externality. Remember, it's, an ex it's a trade in an externality where there are no transaction costs. So in other words, there's no lawyers, there's no bargaining, uh, there's no um, negotiators to pay. It's simply one person pays money to another person 
without any uh, legal costs or uh, administrative costs in doing in doing the, the uh, negotiation. All right, but then we left the coast theory behind and we saw, this is where we finished the other day and we looked at it, this in a, a bit more uh, detail, that um, uh, where there are uh, externalities in large markets, first of all, we, we tend to, to show this by drawing straight lines. And the reason we, we draw straight lines is because along a, a line, if we, had, if we had, for example, at this point, if we had one million, if that was our equilibrium, we can't distinguish along these lines individual consumers. We can't distinguish them because uh, there's too many people um, indicated uh, along the, that curve. So, um, uh, so we just we, we have a straight line to to illustrate the the general increase in demand as the price lowers and the increase in supply in quantity supplied as the price rises. We deal in in straight lines, and we see that the private optimum. Where is the private optimum? The private optimum is going to be where the mar uh, the marginal private private benefit, that is to say, the demand curve, right, that the private marginal benefit is shown by the demand curve, equals the private marginal cost, and that's shown by the supply curve, and that's why the, that's why the equilibrium is where it is. So that's that's what happens in a, in in uh, in a large market, and so far we we haven't we haven't had any introduction of any um, uh, positive or negative externalities. But then we moved on to we moved on to our next uh, diagram. Uh, we moved on to our next diagram, and we saw that externalities. Uh, come in two forms. We might have, right? We might have a situation where a product gives a social benefit, and what that means is that if we are counting all the uh, costs and benefits, we should count not only the private. We should count not only the private social uh, social. Uh, sorry, the private marginal benefit but also the social marginal benefit. And so our curve moves up. Our curve moves up and our equilibrium becomes O. Our equilibrium becomes O. And, and uh, conversely to that, where we have a marginal cost that's caused by the, in this case, it's the uh, production of the product, then our equilibrium likewise would move to a new optimum equilibrium. So I'm going to take these curves uh, separately and I'm going to suggest to you ways in which governments might initiate policies uh, around this. So solutions for externalities. How, how does government, how do we solve externalities? Um, when there are large numbers of people involved, when there are a large number of people, individual negotiation is not possible. So we're really going to be looking for government policy to address these uh, to, to address these externalities. So we, we come to our diagram, we see that coast conditions, where there are large numbers of people, coast conditions do not apply. So the government must intervene. The government must intervene. So the first thing we're going to look at here is a situation in which there is a positive externality. So the next slide, we're just going to look at this situation where there's a, where there's a positive externality. And so we'll, go, we'll just pick this. The, I'm just going to pick this part of the slide out. We're just going to focus on this bit. 
So where we go, there it is there. And it looks a little bit bigger now. And um, I want to give you an example of the sort of product that this might be. All right. So this might be a product where there is a positive um, uh, consumption externality attached to this product. So I'm going to make up an example here. I'm going to say, e.g., university, uni, whoops, it's a terrible. uni education now you're all at university and I want you to think about why you are here uh, for most of you uh, you will be thinking about your own personal development and you'll be thinking about your own benefits so you're here at university and you're thinking about the benefits that come to you as a result of you being at the Uni of New South Wales. Now, what are those benefits? Well, maybe you just become a more ra more rounded person and more interesting person to talk to because you know more, more things about more topics. That's possible. But you are think what you're thinking about when you come here is you. That's natural enough. This is your you're thinking about your marginal benefit. Right, but really it's the marginal private benefit that we're thinking of here. I'm thinking of the marginal marginal private benefit. So I'm just going to stick that P in there. Right, the marginal private benefit. That's what you are thinking about. And of course, the university has costs in in um in providing you an education, the costs of your theatres, of your teachers, of the technology, of Moodle, of everything else. And if this was just a private market, this is what would happen. The university would receive this much from fees, right? The university would receive this much from fees. So that's going to be the price in the free market. And this many students would go to university. That's what's going. That, well, that's what would happen in a private market. Ha, uh, however, uh, governments are very conscious of the fact that education does have a positive externality, because, um, for example, when people uh, achieve an education, they become a much more productive contributor to the workforce. That allows firms and and uh, government departments, government. Uh, functions to become more uh, productive. Um, you'll earn more money and pay more tax. The people that you work for will produce a higher quality and a higher quantity of good. So it's not just good for you when you go to university. So imagine the government says, well, out of for every student that goes to university, we calculate that there's this much benefit, the benefit that I've drawn in green, uh, there's that much benefit to society as a result of each person coming to uh, uni. And so if we were to then uh, uh, acknowledge that in our demand curve, our demand curve here, this demand curve, is really showing the marginal social benefit. Now, what is the marginal social benefit? It's the benefit of the education to you, but it's also the value of the education to society. And if, if our demand curve was um, uh, at, at the uh, second demand curve, at the green demand curve, if our, if our demand was there, our equilibrium would now be at O. In other words, it would be at the O. And what that would mean is that the value we would place on university education would be higher, the price would be higher, and also the, um, the quantity of students coming to university would be higher. So the, the, the next thing for governments to think about is, well, how are we going to make this happen? 
how are we going to do this? How are we going to move the number of students going from to university from PM to PO? How are we going to achieve that? So I'm going to look at that on the next slides. But that's really what the, that's really what the issue is about. Education is giving us a benefit. It's giving society a benefit. We want more people in the education system achieving their uh, degrees and they will contribute back to society. And so we're going to be assisting them to demand more places at university. So one way is to do this. Remember, I'll just go back here. The key task here, the key thought is, how are we moving from the, the, the market, the free market mechanism to the optimum output? Because in the free market, where there is a positive externality, the good will be undersupplied. So one way that um, one way that governments do this is to provide a subsidy to the producer. In other words, a subsidy to the university. So watch what governments might do. Here is the demand curve, and that equals the private marginal benefit. Here is the supply curve that equals the private marginal cost to the university and the the red the, the the black dot represents the equilibrium and here we are at Q uh, M that's QM. So if the government then gives a subsidy to the producer this this reduces this essentially pays some of the producer's cost of production. If the Uni of New South Wales receives um, uh, money, and the way that the way that the university receives money, of course, is that for every um, higher education place, uh, uh, local students uh, receive uh, a a loan from government. And but that loan is paid in bulk to the universities. All right now, if that's paid to the university, then what would happen is the supply curve would move to the right. They would the supply curve would move to the right, and the equilibrium would move from the equilibrium would move from E to E O. I'm going to do EO in red, EO. It's going to move. The number of students will grow. Why will the number of students grow? The number of students will grow because at the, at the new equilibrium, the new equilibrium, the price is lower, right? The price is lower. Price is lower, so the price is P. I'm going to call that P1. It's not PO. I'm going to show you why not in a minute. That is P1. And because the price is lower, the students receive QO. The students enroll Q, uh, to the number QO. So we've got more students. Why have we got more students? Because the price is lower, and so more students can come to the uni. Now, uh, uh, why, why is the university supplying more places? Because the university um, is, is basically doing this. It's getting a subsidy from government, and the subsidy is this big. It's the difference. The subsidy is the difference between the first demand curve and the second demand curve. Uh, sorry, the first supply curve and the second supply curve. And it's getting... It's getting this amount of money, right? It's getting this much money, the difference between those two curves, for each student. And so, in effect, the uni is receiving PO. Uh, how, how is that money being received? Students pay a certain fee, and then the government pays the rest. So the actual fee being received by the uni is both of those things. So the universities are receiving more income 
and as a result, they supply more places and students are paying a low, lower fee, so they demand more places. So in black, here's the students demand, uh, paying a lower fee, and that's why they demand more places. And at the top, in green, the university is receiving more income because it's receiving income from government as well as students. And so that's why they are supplying more places. So there's more being demanded and there's more being supplied. So that's one way that the government could deal with a positive externality is just by giving money to the university. How else could the government give money to or subsidise a product? Uh, maybe it's education or maybe it's some other product. The other way the government could do is this. We could have a demand curve and a supply curve. We have a we have a market, right? We have a equilibrium, right? We have an equilibrium in the market. There's our equilibrium. There is this is our output in the market, QM. And we know that because I'm not going to do this, I'm going to do this in very uh, I'm going to do this very light. We know that there is an extra demand for the product. And so we know that the true optimum is at Q, at QO. The optimum is at QO. Here we are, at QO. Now the question is, how are we going to move the demand curve out there? You'll note in the last diagram, the government intervention moved supply. But here, the government intervention is going to move demand. And when they move demand, the equilibrium will go to EO. The price will go up. Right, the price will go up to PO. The quantity is at QO. And uh, how did this happen? Because this happened because the government gave a subsidy to the consumer. So that, that means that the consumers have more money. They have more money. They can therefore demand more goods, right? The demand curve shifts out. You can see the arrow there in green shifting the demand curve out. And so we move to the new equilibrium. I want you to think about the real effect on this for consumers. Does this mean that the price of the university fees might be higher, right? The price of the university fees might be higher. And many people might ask, well, why would, why would more people go to uni if the fees are going up? And the reason more people go to uni when the fees go up under these circumstances is the fees are higher, but the out-of-pocket costs are lower because the student pays PO, the student pays PO, but then the student is going to get a subsidy, right? The student is going to get some cash from government. So when the student gets cash from government, they can use some of that money to pay their fees. Here it is here. They use this amount of money to pay their fees. And so the actual out-of-pocket cost for students is, is actually PO, PO, not letting me write, yes it is, PO minus the subsidy. So that's what students are actually paying. They're paying a lower price because some of the, they can take their subsidy, they can take their, we might call this, we might call this, sometimes this this subsidy has a different name. Sometimes we call it a scholarship. So if governments are giving scholarships to go to university, that's essentially what they're doing. They're giving students a subsidy. It helps the students pay the fees. So you can see here that both of these policies, both of these policies have moved the uh, quantity out towards the optimum quantity one way by giving money to the 
demand it to help them buy the product. And the other way is to give money to the supplier to help them supply the product. And as a result, uh, because some of their, their supply costs have been paid for them, uh, then they are able to raise the price. So in both cases, the out-of-pocket cost to the, to the buyer falls. And in both cases, uh, the market arrives at the optimum equilibrium. So that's, that's uh, two examples of government policies that, um, uh, that may, governments may use to address um, uh, positive, uh, positive externalities. Okay, so uh, positive production externalities. Well, uh, um, if let's just look at this one here, right? So uh, positive production externalities. Let's take point two. Uh, if in production, if in the in the production of a good, firms use or develop new technology then this can be used by others by can be used right, these can be used by other firms so firms often you develop new technology they often develop new technology in um, in in producing products and where other firms can also get on board with that same technology, then that will create a positive production externality. Uh, also, uh, on-the-job training, right? On-the-job training, you go to work for a firm, uh, you become more expert, and then at some point you leave that firm and go to another firm, then uh, you can see that the, the second firm will also gain from your expertise. So they are examples of positive production technologies. Okay, now let's go to negative externalities. So we're, we're looking here at, um, I'm going to look at, uh, whoops, I'm going to look at uh, this, this, this situation here where, um, that's not the right diagram, we've got to go down again. So when we're looking at negative externalities, we start with a marginal cost curve. This curve represents the, the private marginal cost. But if there's a negative externality, then there will be an additional cost. Right? This, this arrow here, that arrow, is the cost to society or cost to society. or third parties. Now, of course, they both mean the same thing. Uh, so uh, cost of society or third parties, that moves our curve up. This moves our, uh, our, our marginal cost curve. So now this is our, this is our, our social marginal cost curve here. So it's moved up and we've now got a new supply curve and then if we superimpose that new supply curve on the market we superimpose that new supply curve on the market like so there we have there s1 our equilibrium moves from e and this is market equilibrium to e o and while i'm here i'll just get you to just contemplate this idea the reason that we call externalities a a market failure the reason we call it a market failure is because it, it, it's it is because the market price the market price is too low, right? The market price, PM, is too low. The 
the market price is too low. Uh, and and uh, and not only that, but the market quantity is too high. And what we want in government policy, what we want the government policy to do is to make the price higher, right? We, we want the, the government policy, we want the government policy to move the price to the optimum price. So we say this good has more costs than just the private costs. So we want the price of the good to move up and we want the quantity of the good to move down. So we want the quantity to go that way. We want the price. We want the price. We want the price to go up. So uh, that, that's that's the whole point of the intervention in the market. So how can we do this? All right. Well, I'm going to give you uh, a, an example here. Right. So I'm going to imagine a product with a positive, uh, with a um, uh, with a negative. Uh, production externality, right? A negative production externality, e.g., right? Carbon, right? Imagine that we have, a f well, we, we certainly have industries that produce carbon emissions. So, what what could we do about this? Well, in this country, what we did at one point, and and many countries do, is to have a carbon tax. So we have a demand curve, we have a supply curve, and then we introduce the carbon tax, right? We introduce the carbon tax. The tax is paid by the supplier. The tax is paid by the supplier. So there's the tax there, right? That, that arrow equals the tax. The equilibrium moves from E. Now at E, the quantity was QM. That's a terrible M. I'm just going to call it Q1. And, and P1. And the equilibrium moves from there to EO. So now, what, 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 what's going on here? What's going on is that um, the external cost, the cost of this carbon, cost of this carbon is now being paid for by the uh, supplier of the good, and they are going to pass that price onto the consumer of the good. So the price goes up to the optimum quantity, and then in theory, people should reduce their consumption of this good that produces uh, more carbon. So, if we've got, if we're we're using, if we're producing electricity with our uh, by by burning coal, then um, when we introduce the carbon tax, the price of our power bills will go up, and that will make people think about how can we save on electricity in the house. Um, do we buy? Do we buy? Um, more efficient uh, heating or cooking, um, or do we just or do we just use these products less? So it encourages people to reduce their consumption of the harmful product. All right, what about a negative consumption externality? Well, look, we know that cigarette smoking is very harmful, and we we could, of course deal with cigarette smoking in the same way as we deal with carbon emissions, and that is we do tax cigarettes. And when we tax cigarettes, we have the exact same diagram. Uh, it, it pushes up the pushes the supply curve to the left. It pushes up the price of, of cigarettes, and hopefully less people will smoke. But there is another way of dealing with this, and I think this is probably... Uh, the one that actually works better um, in our uh, is probably more effective. The most effective way of actually stopping people smoking 
if we think about demand and supply, if we think about demand and supply, <coughs> and here is our supply curve, here is our demand curve, we know that a tax will do this. We know that a tax will move the supply curve to the right. We know it will move the supply curve to the right. But there is other ways of, of achieving this optimum output. Here is the optimum here. All right, there is our optimum quantity there. I'll just mark it above the line. Now, why is that the optimum? Because we can drop this, we can drop this line down and see where the optimum would be. But I've drawn it in, in very faint lines because that is not how we're going to get to the optimum. The way that we're going to get to the optimum is this. We know that the optimum is at QO. But maybe there's another way of getting there besides taxing the product. And the way, one way that, well, the, the way that we use in Australia, apart from tax, is by restricting the consumption of smoking. You are not allowed to smoke generally on the university. You cannot smoke in an airport. You cannot smoke in a plane. You cannot smoke in an office. You cannot smoke in a shopping centre. Uh, you cannot smoke in a hospital or a school. So there are many places in which you cannot smoke. So if governments go down this path, this is what they're doing. They're basically saying, if you, can, if you can't smoke in so many places, the demand for cigarettes will fall because cigarette smokers have less opportunity to smoke. And so the equilibrium goes from E, M, uh, E market, and, and we, know where the market, we know where the market equilibrium is to PM. Now, what's this going to do to the equilibrium in the market here? This is going to move our market equilibrium here to EO. And the first thing that we'll do is reduce the price of the cigarettes. It'll reduce the price of the cigarettes, PO. So it's going to move them down here. Uh, and uh, it's, sorry, that's not PO. It's going to move the it's going to move the price down. So I'll just relabel that. It's going to remove. It's going to move the price down to there. Uh, more people, less people are smoking. Why are they smoking? They're not smoking because the price is cheaper. They're smoking because less people are smoking, not because the price is cheaper, but because the product is restricted. We, there's, there's so many places we can't smoke. And as a result of the price being cheaper, there's a movement down the supply curve. Firms supply less cigarettes. Why will firms supply less cigarettes? Because when they sell the cigarette, they're getting less for it. And so that's, that's another way that we try and address the negative externality uh, uh, negative externality in Australia. So we're not actually trading goods at the optimum price, which would be up here, but we are achieving we are achieving the optimum quantity. All right, so uh, so products with negative consumption externalities, well, you know, smoking, alcohol abuse, uh, bad driving. So the way that we address all these, of course, is we have tax. Right, we have tax, we have restrictions. We have restrictions. And we, we uh, and of course, uh, for dangerous driving, we have fines. Right, for alcohol, we also have taxes. Right, for alcohol, we also have taxes. And we, and we do, of course, have restrictions on, on alcohol as well. Um, in terms of uh, where we can drink and the ages at which we can drink. So, um, so that, that's the way that, that governments, government policy uh, seeks to address those negative externalities. Okay, so um, 
the, the so I, I now want to so I now want to um, leave the government policy behind. We've we've looked at our diagrams. We've seen what happens in in large markets where we have many buyers and sellers, too, too complicated to negotiate, and uh, it's too, too complicated to negotiate, so uh, um, governments have to get involved, and as we saw, uh, they may get involved in subsidising positive uh, products. Sometimes we call these positive products merit goods, uh, and they may subsidise those products by giving subsidies to the supplier, to make them cheaper so that consumers are more inclined to buy them, or they may subsidise those products by giving um, monies to, to the consumer. And every time the consumer buys the product, the government reimburses them some cash and that, that then um, uh, encourages consumers to, to go and buy the product. I'll give you another example of, uh, of how a subsidy consumer might work. Now, in, um, it, we are now entering the flu season and, and people are being generally encouraged to go and get vaccinated against the flu. And the government understands that there's a positive externality attached to vaccinations because for every individual that gets vaccinated, that individual is less likely to get the flu and less likely to pass the flu on. So we're in the flu season and there's two ways that we tend to get vaccinated. The first way is that on the university, you can just go and enrol and you can get vaccinated for free. So how, how has that come about? That comes about because government is paying the university um, uh, health uh, practice uh, for for every sub for every vaccination they do. So you go the they, the the uh, health practice gets a subsidy, and that subsidy is large enough, in fact, to pay for your entire vaccination. So you don't the, the remaining cost to you will be zero. So that's one way that governments expand the number of. Uh, people being vaccinated is to give a subsidy to the supplier so the cost is low and people go and buy the product because it's low. And in fact, as I said, for the university staff and students, the price is low. In fact, it, it falls to zero. So we're all encouraged to do it. For people who can't access a bulk billing service like that, other people go to a doctor and do pay a fee to see the doctor and get the vaccination. But the way Medicare works in Australia is this. When you go to, Medi when you go to a, uh, a doctor who's going to charge you to vaccinate you, when you do that, you will get some of that money back. So that is, that is the way that the government is providing a subsidy, in this case, not to the supplier, they're paying it to the demander. But because the demander knows they'll be receiving part of the fee that they are paying to the doctor, they're receiving part of that back, uh, then they know that the effective out-of-pocket cost is actually lower than the, than the doctor is charging. So both, way, both times the, the experience of the people being vaccinated is that the, the cost to them is lower and therefore they're more encouraged to consume the service. So there, there are a couple of other policy areas where we, we get involved in um, uh, facilitating or trying to expand the output of, of goods with, with positive externalities. And of course, we saw the, the situations where there are negative externalities and we often deal with those with taxes. Uh, or restrictions. Other ways that we might deal with them is by fining, uh, fining people. And if people understand that by undertaking a, a harmful activity, they have to pay a fine, that in, in effect is a cost to them. And that moves their supply curve to the left in the same way that a tax would. All right, so that's, that's um, 
in the, that's externalities in big markets. I'm now going to return back to the Coase theorem, and I want to add to it, add to it um, with uh, a, a numerical example, because you could very well get examples like this as part of your um, final exam. You have uh, many, a lot of multiple choice questions, and some of them will, will be on, on this topic, and I think you are guaranteed to get something uh, on the Coase theorem. So let's just revisit the Coase theorem for the remainder of the lecture. Okay, so you'll remember this, that, uh, that a solution to externalities, solution to externalities is, solution to externalities where individual individuals can negotiate. What is that solution? What's it look like? It looks like the Coase theorem. And, and people are going to trade in their actual externalities. So the Coase, Coase theorem is, is where we trade in an externality. Uh, and, and of course, then we're always making the assumption, right? We're always making the assumption that there's no transaction costs. In other words, there's no lawyers, right? There's no lawyers, right? There's no, there's no, there's no contract. Expenses. All that happens here is that someone pays someone else some money and there's no middle person. There's no middle person to, to negotiate this. And uh, I want to give you a new example here of um, another, another, uh, another example of an externality. So over on the right hand side, which is kind of obscured, uh, we have the school of rock. Okay, so over here on the right hand side, we have the school of rock, right? I'm going to write the school of rock. And over here, uh, oh, that, that's on the left hand side. On the, on the right hand side, we have the school of maths, right? School of rock and the school of maths. Now, you can make up your mind as to which school you think looks like most fun and which school you would prefer to go to after you, after you finish maybe your, your days um, at high school and where you're going to go spend the afternoon. Are you going to get more tuition in rock or are you going to get tuition in maths? But the thing about these... The thing about the school of rock and the school of maths is that in order for them to operate, they need different conditions. They, they are situated next to each other, but of course the school of rock is going to make a lot of noise. And the school of maths does not want noise, right? They want quiet so people can think about their, their maths issues. So these, these two um, schools actually create externalities for each other. So the school of rock, its externality is pretty obvious. It's making a racket. And when it makes a racket, that is going to disturb the people in the school of maths who are trying to do their trigonometry or whatever they're doing. Uh, on the other hand, the school of maths also creates an externality because if, if they are demanding quiet, in the school of maths, they're also demanding quiet around the school of maths, and that 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 in itself is an externality. So both of these uh, schools are creating an externality for each other. So we have to think what we're thinking about here is this whole idea of the Coase theorem, and remember what the Coase theorem is supposedly doing. What it's supposedly doing is coming up with an efficient outcome. So we have to decide, well, what will an efficient outcome be? Will it be quiet? Is that the efficient outcome? Or is noise the efficient outcome? So in order to 
figure this out. We have to then analyze the numbers around um, uh, these two schools. So we're now given some more information. We're now given some more information. So here, here is the key information that you would be given if you get a, a multiple choice question on this topic. I want to start with the School of Rock. The School of Rock can earn $10,000 if it can make a lot of noise. Well, people, obviously, if you're in the School of Rock, you want to make noise. So they can make $10,000 uh, in tuition if they can make a lot of noise, but uh, they can only make $2,000 if they are forced to be quiet. Uh, how are they going to teach rock if they've got to be quiet? Maybe they've got um, uh, th they've got quiet drum kits, and maybe people can play guitars and keyboards through their headphones. But uh, I think we all recognise that that is not the case. That is not the same. So less people are going to come to the school of rock if they understand that uh, it's it's all going to be quiet. Won't be much uh, fun doing their. Uh, school of Rock uh, after their class, school classes. On the other hand, the School of Maths can earn $14,000 if it is quiet and zero if it's noisy. So now we have to think about, well, what what is the most efficient outcome here? Should Should it be noisy? Uh, is, is, should should we allow it to be noisy or should we force it to remain quiet so the way that we the way that we uh, think about this the way that we think about this is to look at which which uh, of these gives us a greater a greater payoff so I'm going to um, uh, uh, just clean that clean that up and I want you to think about the two payoffs, the one, the two payoffs, if it is noisy, all right. If it's noisy, we're going to get ten thousand dollars for the school of rock, and zero for the school of of uh, maths. So I could say, well, noise, right? Noise equals ten k. Right, noise is going to give us a payoff of 10k. What is quiet going to give us? 2,000 plus 14,000. So quiet gives us 16,000. So 16,000 dollars. So we can see that quiet is actually collectively more efficient. So we need the Coase theorem to arrive at a situation where it, around these two uh, businesses, it's actually going to be quiet in the afternoon rather than noisy. Now, if you are a drummer and you don't like uh, you don't like a, 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 a quiet drum kit, then you're not going to enjoy this. But we're not looking for what's good for an individual. We're looking for what is is mostly beneficial for society. So we then move to the next part here. How are we going to achieve quiet? Or, uh, or, or how are we going to achieve quiet? So this is where we get into the area of what we call property rights. Uh, and um, a property right is it allows a business to to have uh, to have a certain circumstance work in its favour. So uh, it might be that uh, the school of rock has the uh, right to make a noise. So you'd say you might say, well, that means that the school of rock will make a noise. They want to make a noise. They can earn ten thousand dollars if they make a noise. Only two thousand if they don't. Too bad for uh, the school of maths. And so there will be noise. Or you might say, uh, oh no, this will we'll give the, the right to the School of Maths to have quiet. And the School of Maths will say to the School of Rock, well, we've got the right to be quiet, for everything to be quiet. 
if you make a noise, we're called calling the council and the, the police will shut you down. So uh, therefore, uh, we have that right and we're enforcing the right. But the thing about the Coase theorem is this. It doesn't matter who has the right. In the end, you will get the same result. So I want to, I want to then uh, explore how this is, is going to operate. Uh, imagine that uh, School of Rock uh, has the right to make noise and the School of Maths doesn't want them to make noise, but they don't have the right to enforce it. The Coase theorem says they can buy that right from the, from the School of Rock. They can go to the School of Rock and basically say, we know you have the right to make noise, but we're going to pay you off and, and uh, so that you are quiet. So we, let's see if that's going to work. So uh, this is so um, if the school of rock, we, we've seen that uh, we've seen that the socially efficient outcome is, is to be quiet. We've 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 added those two up. We've seen that that quiet, right? Quiet is sixteen thousand, whereas noise is just ten thousand. So uh, it's it's more efficient to be quiet. So then we say, all right, uh, they share the building. Uh, they've got these payoffs. So now I want to imagine now that suppose the school of rock. I might go, I'm going to go to the school of noise, actually. No, I'm going to go to the school of rock, uh, school of maths. The school of maths has the right to be quiet. So here is, here's its right. It's been given that right by the local council. As I said, it doesn't matter who has the right uh, uh, to start with. We're going to wind up with an efficient solution. So what's going to happen here? They have the right to be quiet. The School of Rock, if we go back to the School of Rock, think about the School of Rock. There's an $8,000 difference, right? There's an $8,000 difference there. So the School of Rock could say to the School of uh of uh, maths, look, we'll give you seven thousand dollars, right? We'll give you seven thousand, and if if they gave them if they gave them seven thousand, I'll just cross that out. Imagine that they give them they offer, right? If they offer seven thousand uh, dollars, why would they offer it? Well, because uh, if if that if it's quiet, they get two thousand. But if they offered ten thousand, uh, seven thousand to the school of uh, maths, then they would receive ten thousand dollars in fees minus seven, and they'd be they'd be they'd be earning more money uh, if they can offer that money to the school of uh, maths. But the maximum they can offer to the school of maths is $8,000, right? That's the maximum they, they could afford to offer. Because if they offer any more than that, uh, then they'd be saying, well, $10,000 minus more than eight is going to give us less than two. And so we're actually going to be worse off. So the maximum possible offer is $8,000 from the School of Rock to the School of Noise. So, uh, so the School of Rock will offer up to eight thousand uh, dollars. The School of uh, Maths would then collect the eight thousand dollars, but then it would be noisy, right? It would be noisy, and so when they collect the eight thousand dollars from the School of Rock, it's noisy, and their their fees actually took fall from fourteen thousand to zero. So. They're not going to accept 8,000. The School of Maths declines the offer, right? The School of Maths declines the offer because in order for the School of Maths to accept the offer, the School of Rock would need to offer them more than $14,000 and the School of Rock cannot afford to do it. So the School of Maths is going to earn 
$14,000. Why is it going to earn $14,000? Because it's quiet. Why is the School of Rock going to earn $2,000? Because it's quiet. The collective income is $16,000. And if we go back to our previous slides, if we go back to our previous slide, we saw that the most efficient outcome was to have the quiet and the earnings would be 16000 So they've achieved the most efficient result. They've achieved a, a collective income of 16000 This does not mean everyone is happy, right? It doesn't mean everyone is, 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 uh, is happy to the same extent, but it does mean that the, the return to society is 16000 instead of 10000 if a maximum of 10,000 if there was noise. So therefore, the, uh, the, uh, the efficient result is the, the efficient result is silence, and that's achieved by, the, by uh, the School of Maths having the right to negotiate. They did negotiate, but the School of Rock could not offer uh, an amount big enough to pay the School of Maths off. Okay, now we're going to reverse the situation here. What if the School of Rock has the right to make noise? That means the School of Maths could offer some amount over $8,000. Now, how much over $8,000? Well, we, we could just say $1 over the $8,000. And in theory, the School of Rock will accept because now they're getting $8,000, more than $8,000 from the School of Maths plus the, the remaining $2,000, so their income would actually go up. So will the School of Rock uh, uh, accept their offer, right? So th they're trying to buy the right, right? What are they trying to buy the right? They're trying to buy the right to quiet, right? They're trying to buy the right to quiet. They're trying to buy, they're trying to trade the right to noise away. Okay, so um, so what, what's in this for the School of Maths? Well, what's in it for the School of Maths is if there is noise, they're going to earn nothing. But if they pay 8,000, they can then gain 14,000. The benefit will be greater than the cost. So they can pay 8,000. And so their income will no longer be zero. If there's noise, their income is zero. But if they pay the eight thousand, their income can become six thousand dollars. So let's imagine that the school of rock accepts the offer and enforces the right, uh, and uh, and and then infor and then uh, trades. We shouldn't write that word enforces, right? Um, it, it sells, right? It sells the right to silence. And then who is going to earn what now? I'll just clean this up from, so we can get on to the next line. Who is going to earn what? The School of Maths is going to earn 14,000 minus 8,000. So that's 6,000. And the School of Rock earns 2,000 plus 8,000 from the School of Maths. And so the return is 16,000 as against 10,000. Now, does it, does it need to be an $8,000 payment? It doesn't need to be an $8,000 payment, right? It doesn't need to be that. So let's just have a, another quick look at this. It has to be a payment of more than 8,000. So I'll just do another example here, another quick example, e.g., right? What if they paid... What if they what if they agreed to pay not eight but nine? Right? What if they agreed to pay eight but nine? Right? So they're going to pay nine thousand. Right? They and they would gain fourteen thousand. So their income would now be five thousand. Right, their income 
det er en kamp. Right, the school of maths income would be 5,000. I'll do that in green. They've had to pay school of rock 9,000. They get 14,000 in fees. And what's, what's the school of rock earn? The school of rock earns 9,000 from the school of maths. It's going to be quiet. So they're only getting $2,000 in fees. Right, but that's 11,000. And we put those two together, we add those two together, and we're going to get 16,000. So uh, either way, uh, the, as long as the amount is 8,000, uh, above 8,000, the, the end result will still be that the market arrives at the equilibrium. It arrives at the equilibrium and, um, uh, and, um, and the efficient outcome is achieved. Uh, okay, so uh, I've just been uh, I've just been playing around with the slides here a little bit. Um, uh, that ends chapter nine. Now this is your last week of lectures, and tomorrow the next lecture that you do, uh, 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 some or all of it will be uh, done by Alberto, and the reason is because he wants to take people back through the game, back through all the uh, through the play economics. Um, to get everyone familiarised with uh, uh, what's going to happen with the exam and um, how, how you all um, will uh, uh, sit for that exam and also the, the wrapping up of, of the assessments that you have to do, uh, the progressive assessments you're doing on play economics. So he will be doing part of that. Because he's going to be spending some time doing that, I just want to introduce you to the next, the, the next topic. Um, we have about 15 minutes. Look, I think I will not do that. I think I'm going to wrap this up here. I, I don't think there's enough time left for me to finish, um, uh, to, to start the, the next lecture and um, and get any way through it that, that is of any value to anyone. So I think I'll just end the lecture here um, and um, I will see you for part of the lecture on Wednesday and then Alberto will be wrapping that up with you as well. All right, so thanks for your attention uh, and uh, I'll, I'll end the lecture here.